Thank you. Sorry about that. So I, uh, repeating, I, I hope that you were able to hear the prayer. I didn't project probably as I should have. The, um, if you would open your Bibles, please, and follow along. We'll read for, uh, the context of our text, and then we'll again read from the book of Hebrews, a different place, that, and that shows us how what we read in the Old Testament here is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, open your Bibles, if you would, to, first of all, to the Old Testament, to 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8. And we'll begin reading a couple verses before our text, our sermon text, at verse 52. Now, the setting, let me set the stage for you. Solomon is, the, the temple has just been completed. Solomon is praying a prayer of dedication uh, for, uh, regarding this great house of the Lord. Must have been an amazing thing to behold. And we kind of interrupt him in the middle of his prayer here at verse 52. He prays, That your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance as you spoke by your servant Moses when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. And so it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord that he arose from before the altar, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven, then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And may these words of mine, which I have made, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, and he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day may require, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. At that time, Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with him, a great assembly, from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days, and seven more days, 14 days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king and went to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. Now, if you would keep a marker there, and we'll, come, we'll move over to Hebrews for some commentary about this passage, about this, these activities throughout the Old Testament, all fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews 9, this time. And we'll read Hebrews 9, verses 9 through 15. Just a short reading to see how, on the one hand, there was these many promises, and on the other hand, now fulfillment in the new, new covenant. Hebrews 9, 9. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and... Let me change my emphasis. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect in regards to the conscience, 
concerning only, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats, goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's God's word for God's people. Now we turn back to 1 Kings 8 to our sermon text beginning at verse 54. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, people everywhere long to be blessed. In fact, it is becoming common. Perhaps I, you know I work at Home Depot a few days a week, unfortunately. And we hope that will not be too much longer. But one of the things that's interesting to see, it's a, it's a snapshot of the culture of California. And I'm seeing more and more people wearing a, a shirt that just simply says, blessed. I don't know what they mean by that exactly. I hope that God is in the picture. But people call themselves blessed for many and various reasons because there is the longing in the human heart to be blessed. And people will try all kinds of things in order to get God to bless them. Pilgrimages, perhaps even going so far as moving out into becoming a hermit somewhere, uh, afflicting oneself and, and forms of asceticism and just to name a few. But by contrast, Reformed and Presbyterian churches have what we call in our worship service a benediction. And I paused in the middle of the word to show you its root in Latin, two words, bene meaning good and diction meaning speech. It speaks of something which is good diction or a beneficial word that we receive from the hand of the minister at the end of a worship service. It's good speech. It's a word of blessing. And every week we need a word of blessing from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One translation of the, of the Old Testament, you know how your Bibles have little headings at each point. Here the heading is, in this trans particular translation, Solomon's Benediction. And I picked up on that for the title of our sermon today. There is, uh, we see here in this benediction, uh, uh, that is to say, if we take a snapshot of what was happening in this time in the history of Israel, in the history of redemption, God's kingdom was firmly established under Solomon. This was the golden age of Israel. The, the territory of Israel was expanded all the way to the river Euphrates and all the way to the Mediterranean, and not to mention north and south. Not to mention there, Solomon sits on the throne as the wisest king who ever lived in any kingdom. One writer, his name is S.G. de Graff, writes a book called Promise and Deliverance you may have in your library. He says this about this particular setting, the Lord had shown he was Israel's glorious king. Therefore, it would now be fitting for the Lord to live in the midst of a people in a glorious house. A king who would rule over God's people forever would spring from David's seed, end quote. That's where we find ourselves. As we look at this chapter and get our bearings in 1 Kings, in verses 22 through 53, we have this prayer of Solomon's dedicating the temple to the service of the Lord. We follow that tradition in the Reformed and Presbyterian churches. We'll have a dedication of a building as part of our order of worship, or that is to say part of our directory of worship. Then in 54 through 61, that is our sermon text, Solomon blesses the assembly, much as you are blessed with a greeting or a benediction. And then in 62 through 66, Solomon dedicates the temple. 
This here we have before us is the king's or a king's benediction for Yahweh Jehovah's people. We'll see that in four ways. I hope you have an outline that follow along. First, Yahweh has given rest to his people. Second, Yahweh will be with us. Third, Yahweh will maintain our cause. And fourth, Yahweh provides an atoning sacrifice. Let's look at those one at a time. In this king's benediction for God's covenant people, Yahweh, first of all, we are told, has given rest to his people. We know Solomon's story. We know it began well and ended terribly. And that just goes to underscore the need and the longing in the hearts of the people of Israel for the coming of Messiah, a perfect king. Solomon here, as all the kings in some form or fashion, either picture something about the coming king or stand in stark contrast with with the Messiah, the coming king, as to what he will not be. The Lord Jesus Christ is pictured here in Solomon and is portrayed as a great and mighty king, the wisest of all kings, but also... Solomon left the people sadly longing for that perfect or longing for that perfect king, that greatest high priest. Jesus said of himself, you may remember in Matthew 12, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. We read in verse 55 that King Solomon stood and blessed all the assembly of the people of Israel with a loud voice. And he said in verse 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. He did not say, by the way, Blessed be the Lord who has given wealth to his people. Or blessed be the Lord who has given health to his people or prosperity, or victory over their enemies, or great power, or fame, or great status. No, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people. That is the emphasis here. And in this, Solomon again foreshadows the coming Christ. Jesus Christ has given given rest to his people according to all that he promised. Sometimes we sing a song in the Trinity hymnal, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. We think of the words of our Savior when he was incarnate on this, wor- on this earth. And he promised in Matthew 20, 11, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, you know the rest, and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls and every Christian knows this to be the truth that's already true for us as Christians we are resting in Christ he has given us rest for our souls But not yet have we experienced that in its fullness. We read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Already we have rest in Christ, but a day is coming that is not yet here when Christ returns we are going to experience a heavenly rest that is eternal. Sometimes when you have, perhaps you've been to any uh, funeral from time to time, and as the minister is conducting the service, perhaps he says that he, we are committing this one to his eternal or heavenly rest. There's nothing wrong with that. We are looking forward to that time when our labors are in this world are done and we take up the labors it is somewhat of a in our minds a a a paradoxical thing that on the one hand we will not be just flying around on clouds 
with harps in our hands, singing hymns all throughout eternity. We will have work to do. And yet, at the same time, it is promised a promised rest from the, the difficult labors of this life. In this life, probably most of you will lack a great deal of wealth. You will, there will come a time for each and every one of us where we will lack health. You possibly, probably most of us will not achieve a carefree life in this life, nor will we have great prosperity or great power or great fame or great status. Non-Christians may have those things and more, but they are restless, aren't they? Because they have a God-shaped hole in the middle of their being that only God can fill. They try to fill the, that void with all of these things I have mentioned and more. But nothing can fill that void. They, are, they remain restless. But you, brothers and sisters in Christ, you have this supreme blessing from our Lord and Savior. You have what Solomon prayed for, spiritual rest in Christ. Treasure that with all of your being. We see the means of this promised rest in verse 56. The king goes on to pray this way as he prays back God's word to him. He says, There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. Whenever we are in the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, there is a, many of the Reformed and Presbyterian theologians like to speak of the already and the not yet. Whenever we're in the Old Testament in particular, but in some sense any part of the Bible, there is a sense in which we are already experiencing what is promised there. And there is also the expectation of that which is not yet the fullness of whatever it is that is promised. And so it is with this rest. The, the, the rest is connected to the Word of God here. The reason that we can be sure that we have rest in Christ and that there awaits us an eternal rest, a rest beyond any imaginative things we can imagine, is because there has not failed one word of all the promise of our covenant God. For them, the Old Testament saints who were living in the days of Solomon and his successors, they experienced a kind of rest in the promised land, didn't they? They had been on the march for 40 years through the wilderness. They had to run away from Egypt for their lives, literally. They had finally, then they had to do battle with all the Canaanites and all the other ites, as J. Vernon McGee used to say on his radio program. But finally, they had a measure of rest. And as I said, this became the golden age of Israel, they, which they would look fondly back on 480 years of rest from Moses to Solomon. But that was temporary, wasn't it? That land was soon taken away from them by the Babylonians. That land was soon taken away from them by the Assyrians and the Greeks and the Romans and fill in the blank. That was the already that there was a fulfillment of this already in the days of Solomon where the people finally had a sense, a time to rest in the land. But this, it left them longing for this eternal and spiritual rest. For us now on the other side of the cross, we rejoice in that spiritual rest that we have in Christ. And it is ours because He promised it and not one word of His promises failed. We, won't, we, know, we all know what it's like, I'm sure. Those of us with any either gray hair or no hair know what it's like to have something promised to us, something warranted, something guaranteed, only to find out later that the, what we expected was not delivered. The company 
may or may not honor it. Someone said that my, one of my bosses once told me that any contract is only as good as the man who or the person who puts their signature on it. But that's not so with God's promises, is it, beloved? When God promises rest, we have rest. When God promises we will have eternal rest, we will have eternal rest. All the promises in Christ are yes and amen. His promises are an ironclad guarantee that cannot be broken. Revelation 14, 13 says it this way. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. That's the first thing. Yahweh has given rest to his people. That's the first part of this king's benediction. The second part is that Yahweh, the promise that Yahweh will be with us. The second part of this blessing or benediction is Yahweh will be with us. Yahweh will be with us as he was with our spiritual forefathers. Look at verse 57. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. Praise Solomon. Already in the days of Solomon, there was, the blessing of the Lord was indeed poured out upon that nation and that people, that covenant people of God. But they left it, they were always longing for Emmanuel to come. They were always longing for the fulfillment of the promise given by Isaiah, God with us, Emmanuel, the Christ. Jesus, as he comes on the scene and just before he leaves the scene in his ascension, he says to the disciples in those final days and hours in Matthew 28, 20, part of that great commission that perhaps we overlook. We know about go, go out and preach the gospel to every creature and so on, make disciples. But the, the second half of that it, it has this wonderful promise from Emmanuel. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a promise from the lips of Christ himself, from the lips of our Lord and Savior Jesus himself, I am with you always. Solomon asked for that. May the Lord God be with us as he was with our fathers. We experience that by God's grace, brothers and sisters. He is with us always. We read the also sent... Solomon the king makes this wish. May he not leave us, nor forsake us. And as you think about your Old Testament history, you know that from time to time the Lord did give up his people to their enemies for a brief period of time. He did allow them to be plundered by the Babylonians and Assyrians. And so he prays, may the Lord not leave us, nor forsake us. And perhaps your mind has already gone to Hebrews 13, where the apostle writes and says to us, Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. In the original, it's a, it's a, a repetition. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Yahweh will be with us. That's the second part of this blessing. He is with us as he was with our fathers. He is with us also to incline our hearts to himself. That's part of his being with us. Notice verse 58. That he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. It's a little bit ironic that and I put the emphasis on the word his, his here because Solomon himself marries hundreds of women who turn his heart from the Lord to other gods. And yet here, in, he starts out well praying rightly, 
May the Lord give us the grace to walk not in the ways of Baal or the Ashtoreths or many other gods, Dagon and so on, but may God help us to keep His commandments, His ways, His statutes, His judgments. Our Lord and God is us, with us, brothers and sisters, not for profit, not, as Joel Osteen says, for your best life now, not for your temporary happiness. He is with us, among other things, to incline our hearts to Himself, constantly empowering us by His Word and Spirit, inclining our hearts to walk in His ways, which He commanded our fathers, to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments. As we think about our what we're reading here in the Old Testament and how it's fulfilled in the New. On the one hand, we see a continuity between the Old and the New in the sense that, yes, Yahweh dwelt among His people there. He put His name in Zion. He put His name on that house, that place, that temple. But we see discontinuity in the sense that today and from the time of the resurrection of Christ until now, That dwelling with us is not in a physical temple like this church building. He dwells now in living stones, not made with hands. Christ, the sinless King of Kings, lives within us. Colossians 1.27 puts it this way. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That is a mystery that is difficult to understand. How is it that Christ can be sitting at the right hand of the Father and yet be in us at the same time? Our catechism, the Heidelberg, reminds us that yes, by His Godhead and majesty, grace, and spirit, He is at no time absent from us. Though in His physical being, He resides there at the right hand of of the Father. Christ is in you, beloved, the hope of glory, something that no doubt Solomon could not fathom. We've been to the table of the Lord today, and we've been reminded of this very fact, the Emmanuel principle, some call it, that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Yahweh, is with us. Our catechism asks this question, what does it mean to eat the crucified body and drink the shed blood of Christ? The answer, it means to be so united more and more to his sacred body by the Holy Spirit who dwells both in Christ and in us that although he is in heaven and we are on earth, we are nevertheless flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and live and are governed forever by one spirit as members of the same body are governed by one soul. That's the second promise, the second part of this benediction. Yahweh will be with us. He is with us forever, always. Now the third thing in this king's benediction. Yahweh will maintain our cause Now the other two seem to have themes that are echoed in the New Testament. Perhaps this one sounds a little strange to our ears. We understand the cause of Israel and we understand how they had to be diligent to maintain the cause of Yahweh in the promised land against all aggressors, foreign and domestic. We understand how God has given us rest in Christ. We understand how God will be with us, but this perhaps sounds strange to our Christian ears. Yahweh will maintain our cause. The first thing we see is that Yahweh will maintain our cause by answering our prayers. Notice verse 59. And may these words of mine, praise Solomon, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, That here it is, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require. Again, Solomon the king typifies Christ, the king of kings, and our great high priest and our advocate. 
What, does, what is Jesus Christ doing at the right hand of God the Father? He is certainly ruling and reigning over the universe. That is true. But he is also, we've read it both this morning and this evening, that he is making intercession for us as our great high priest. He is maintaining the cause of his people as each day may require. He brings our prayers and our supplications near our Father in heaven. Day and night, by the way, this high priest never rests, never stops interceding. The old King James says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. The new King James reads this way, therefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Yes, he maintains our cause by answering our prayers. He also maintains our cause by defending us. And once again, Solomon foreshadows the Christ, the great king, the defender of God's people against all enemies. Christ always has been, Christ always will be the defender of his sheep. Perhaps your mind goes back to that battle of Jericho when Joshua sees this warrior standing there and he goes to find out, are you with us or against us? And basically the warrior says, neither, get behind me. I come as the captain of the Lord of hosts. I'm going to take this city. And then as fast forwarding all the way to the end, the book of Revelation 12, we read this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. We can fully depend on our king and our great high priest to maintain his cause and the cause of his people at all times. We can depend, him, depend on him to maintain our cause, brothers and sisters, as long as it is consistent with his cause. That's why the motto of Reformed and Presbyterian churches is Semper Reformanda, always reforming, always wanting our cause to be lined up with his cause having the confidence that he will maintain our cause as we do so. He will give us, notice the language of the New King James as it's written here, as each day may require. That is to say, he gives grace and defense suitable to each occasion. Grace just when we need it. To maintain, he maintains our cause not too soon or not too late does he come to our defense. Why will he maintain our cause? Verse 60. That all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God. There is no other. He maintains the cause of his people. We prayed just, re just now for the persecuted church all over the globe. It seems that no one is maintaining their cause. But the unseen hand of the Lord is there. Maintaining the cause of his persecuted church. He, by means of maintaining his church, gathering, defending, and preserving his church, his chosen ones, broadcasts his superiority to all the other so-called God, so gods of the world, whether they go by the name of Allah or Vishnu or Buddha or whatever other name they may take. Christ, as we sing sometimes, shall have dominion. Earth's remotest regions shall his empire be. Already, there is an already and a not yet here as well, brothers and sisters. Already, all the peoples of the earth know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the one true God. That is to say, not that they would necessarily confess it. But what I mean by that is every people group on this planet, now in this 21st century, has been, has been reached with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not every individual, but every people group. That couldn't be said in a century ago. 
his name already. All the peoples of the earth already know that the Lord is God and there is no other. But there is a not yet aspect to this as well. The church is growing. There are individuals, there are individual tribes among those people groups who have not yet heard the name of Jesus Christ. The King of Kings says, as Abraham Kuyper used to like to say, every square inch of this earth is mine. Yahweh will maintain our cause. That's the third thing. The last thing is in this benediction is Yahweh provides an atoning sacrifice. And that sounds like something we celebrated this morning, doesn't it? Well, it was a very different sacrifice back then, wasn't it? The king joins the priests in offering 142,000 animals to make peace with Yahweh, a number that's staggering to the imagination. Perhaps you've taken the five and driven down toward L.A. and past Harris Ranch, and it seems like there must be 142,000 cows there, but they're not, I assure you. That's a staggering number, isn't it? Uh, underscored and listed for us just again by the Holy Spirit to emphasize that all the blood of bulls and goats in the entire world from the time of Adam to today could not make atonement for sin. Christ, we read, came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. And so king and people in verses 65 and 66 have a wonderful celebration and time of worship as he holds this feast. And they gather the people together for 14 days of celebration and dedication of this temple. And the people leave and go to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. Christ did, beloved. If that celebration was great, there's no question about it. What a party. But yet it pales in comparison to what we've experienced just at the table of the Lord today because Christ did what 142,000 sacrifices could not do. Sometimes we sing this song, Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They strongly cry for me, forgive him, Lord. Forgive, they cry, nor let that ransom sinner die. And that prayer is answered at the cross. Yahweh provides an atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary so, in conclusion, verse 61, we have this charge from our covenant-keeping God. We've heard promise after promise after promise, but now the command, verse 61. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in His statutes and keep His commandments as at this day. Let your heart be loyal, or let your heart be true, wholly true to the triune God. And once again in this charge Solomon foreshadows the Christ our chief prophet who is constantly challenging us even by this means the proclamation of his word challenging us as his disciples to be holy to true to our triune God constantly challenging us as his disciples to walk in his statutes and in his commandments like our spiritual and faithful forefathers after all, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Sinful Solomon left believers longing for a king who perfectly would glorify God continuously in every thought, in every word, in every action. And our Lord Jesus Christ is that king. During his earthly ministry, his heart was always perfect with the Lord our God. He always walked in God's commandments, his father's commandments. He always kept the Lord's statutes. 
and thank God that his righteousness is counted as ours by faith, brothers and sisters. We celebrated that at the table today too. Our, forgive me and Thank you.